2.0. Photosynthesis 2.0. So if you would be so kind as to copy, as to copy this reaction, and it's not your typical chemical reaction, but to copy this reaction, because I think presenting the light dependent reactions this way triggers us to think about this in the proper context, I think. Okay, so we've got light as a reactant. You would never put light in a typical chemical reaction because light is not a chemical, right? Although water, that's, that's a perfectly satisfied, satisfiable? No, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to put as a reactant. And then ATP, that's fine to put as a product as long as you put ADP and phosphorus as a reactant, but we're not doing that. And then electrons, that's okay to put in a chemical reaction, but you usually only see it in like nuclear reactions when you're splitting atoms. Okay, so when you put it this way, the reason why I think it puts it in the proper context is it helps us to think about what needs to happen. Okay, so when, when we made ATP during cellular respiration, what did it require? We made ATP two different ways during cellular respiration. One of those ways was how we made ATP during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. And what did we do there? When we made ATP either in glycolysis or in the Krebs cycle, where we directly made ATP, what did it require? Katie? Breaking apart bonds. It did. It required, it required breaking bonds in something to fuel adding a phosphate group to ADP, right? And so we made ATP two different ways. Two ways to make ATP. You have what's called substrate Wait, level. Like energy, um, energy currency of the cell. You bet. It's like the dollar. Okay, it's the energy currency of the cell. So we make it two ways. One is substrate level phosphorylation. This is what we saw in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, where we took ADP and we took phosphate both as a substrate and an enzyme catalyzed putting them together. Okay, do you remember which steps of glycolysis make ATP directly by substrate level phosphorylation? Flipping back in your notes is not remembering. I know, but it, uh, it does. Jobs. Step seven and step ten. Is it coming back? Step seven and step ten of glycolysis make ATP this way by substrate level phosphorylation. ADP comes, an inorganic phosphate comes, you attach them together. And then we have one reaction in the Krebs cycle that makes ATP this way. Do you remember? It's like succinyl-CoA. Yes, succinyl-CoA synthetase is the enzyme that catalyzes that. You take succinyl-CoA, you convert it into what? Succinate. And as you do that, you attach a phosphate group to ADP. Okay, so that's one way to make ATP, substrate level phosphorylation. Saw that in glycolysis, saw it in Krebs cycle. There's one other way to make ATP, which we also saw in cellular respiration, and what is that? It's when we make most of our ATP, and we made it during, what do we call that? Well, we use NADH and we use FADH2, but what do we call that process? It's the other name for the electron transport chain, Kyle. This is your area. Oxyphos. Oh, that's what I said. Oxidative I was thinking. phosphorylation. Is that okay, oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, that's the other way to make ATP. And that's where we took electrons, 
we drop them down energy levels to fuel what? What are the electrons <laughs> dropping down the electron transport chain fuel? Oh, the protein. The active oh, transport oh, of yeah. hydrogen ions, right? <laughs> those, <laughs> those, those, you call them proton pumps because a hydrogen ion is just a proton. But anyways, you could call them proton pumps or they fueled the active transport of hydrogen. And how did that make ATP? How does actively transporting hydrogen ions make ATP, Emma? It does, because then they wanted to fuse down that concentration gradient. You've been throwing them, I mean, you're basically filling a balloon full of hydrogen ions they don't want to stay in there. That the walls of the balloon are squeezing in on them and forcing them back down. And they go through ATP synthase and make it that way. All right. Now, think about this. When you break down glucose in the presence of oxygen, how many ATP do you get? In the presence of oxygen. So through aerobic respiration, if you fully oxidize glucose, how many ATP do you get, Lydia? 32 to 34, okay? You get 32 to 34 ATP by breaking down glucose. So photosynthesis is going to make glucose by oxidizing or by reducing carbon dioxide. How many ATP do you think it's going to require? A lot or a little? Let's just say that. A lot. So if by breaking it, you get a lot. To make it, it's probably going to require a lot. Okay, do you make a lot of ATP this way? In glycolysis, step seven and step 10, we made four, right? We really make two, but you do seven and 10 twice for every one glucose molecule, so you make four. And then in the Krebs cycle, we made two more. Do you make a lot of ATP using this type of phosphorylation? Isa. I just have a question. Um, what's considered like a lot of ATP? Um, I mean, it's really relative, yeah. you know? I would say the the total amount of ATP a cell makes and breaks every day, that's a lot of ATP. But, I mean, so during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we make six ATP. What would you, like, what would you compare like one ATP to? Yeah. In like a dollar? You want the ATP to dollar yeah. conversion ratio? Sure. Um, well, let's see. So if the average cell in your body makes and breaks 100 pounds of ATP a day, I would say the average person in Santa Clarita makes and spends, what, $300 a day, $400 a day? Wait, really? Well, I mean, what do you think the median income is in Santa Clarita? I'd say the median household income is 90000 a year, maybe? The median, the middle... Okay, so let's say that's $90,000 a year. So divided by 365, that would be something like $300 a day-ish. Is that right? Somebody do, nine, somebody do 90,000 divided by 365. <laughs> On a calculator, not in your head. 90,000, $246 a day. Okay, so the average person in Santa Clarita makes and spends $240 a day. That's family, okay? So the average family in Santa Clarita. So if we're going to do a ATP to dollar ratio, 100 pounds of ATP is equal to $240. So, I don't know, each pound of ATP is equal to, what is that, $2.5-ish? So but a pound of ATP, that's a lot. I mean, that would require a lot of ATP to make a pound. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm just talking about if, if we're going to go and we're going to use cellular respiration as an example, we only make six of the ATP this way. We make 28 of it this way, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to require a lot of ATP to make glucose, which way do you think we're going to make ATP in photosynthesis? Do you think we're going to make it this way? Or do you think we're going to make it this way? Oxidative. Okay. So oxidative oxyphos requires what? What's the other name for oxidative phosphorylation, Kyle? Electron transport chain. So you would predict that in the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis, what are we going to have? Kyle? An electron transport chain. Look at this. What is one of our products looking at it this way? Electrons. 
Oh man, we are in a good spot. And then according to what's written here as our reactants, where do you think these electrons are coming from? Are they coming from light? Does light provide electrons? No. Where do you think they're coming from? The only other option, they're coming from water. Well, that's interesting because where, how do we make water in cellular respiration? Remember, water is a product of cellular respiration. It's not glycolysis. It's the oxyphos. When oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor, it takes those electrons and then combines with hydrogen to form what? What happens when oxygen combines with hydrogen? What do we make? Look at this. When oxygen combines with hydrogen, we make water. So we made this in cellular respiration when oxygen act as the final electron receiver. Well, what about if oxygen gives its electrons? Then we can do almost the reverse process. This is good stuff, right? Do you see any problems with this? Okay, so electrons are here. Our electrons are coming from here. Okay, this is where our electrons are coming from. Are these electrons at a high energy level or a low energy level? What do you think? Let's strategize here. Oh, let's see. I would say Let's high. see. Okay, she says high, you say low. High. Middle. Carrie low. says low, Katie says low. It's not low. It's low. It is low because remember, oxygen is the final electron acceptor because it's way down here. Oh, so yeah. That's so these electrons are super duper low. Low energy electrons. Okay? This is really important, and you're missing it, to talk about, I don't even know, what, what are we talking about? I'm talking about Yeah. Oh, that's all her. Okay. So these are super low energy electrons. How do we get super low energy electrons to drop down an electron transport chain? Yeah. Okay. My answer was the electron. Because, I mean, you, you, we, this, we, we said in, when electrons go to oxygen, that's about as low energy as electrons can get. Do you see anything in here in our reaction that might provide some energy? The light. The light. Here's what happens. You need to, it seems like, if you get nothing else, if you take zero bits of information from photosynthesis and store it in long-term energy other than this, you would not be in a great spot, but you'd at least be in an acceptable spot, okay? If you took nothing else. This is the most important concept to understand with regards to photosynthesis, is what happens when an electron absorbs light, okay? So I want you all to draw this. Here we've got a, we've got an atom. Aww. Wait, Adam. I was literally going to say that. Well, I said Adam it first. I was thinking uh, how about let's name him Jeff? Yeah, but it's spelled differently, and that's just frustrating. Okay. So here's the nucleus of the atom. Y'all see this? Yes. Okay. Y'all, y'all see this? Okay. That's one atom. This is one atom, and here's an electron. Here's an electron. We know that innermost energy level can only hold two electrons, right? Y'all remember that? And then we'll just put one more electron. So. If. Why? Because this is this is a lithium atom. Okay, lithium is sitting right here on our periodic table, and so when lithium is uncharged, it has three protons. It also has three electrons. Okay, so we've got one, two, three electrons. Okay. So the neutrons and the protons are in the nucleus. Yeah, they weigh the same, and then the protons and the electrons have the same magnitude of charge but opposite signs. Okay, so now. We, you need to know what happens when an electron gets hit by light, okay? So here is light, light, and this is drawn in a very specific way because light travels as a wave, and look at that, there's a wave, yeah, Mark. I think it might be a good thing, it might be going into more like physics realm here. Or yes. Or whatever, or whatever, but it's like, I believe when, it's like, it, in the, in the, basically, like, if there's like a, a, there's like a spectrum of, like, let's say, like, Shh, 
Guys, Mark's asking the is question. It, like, I know there's like, let's say like a spectrum of like a star or something like that. Yes. Like the light that, like basically that, that, is, that comes from that, you'll see there's like a spectrum, there's like those black lines. Different colors. And, and sure. so those black lines are, are different elements. Yes, you're getting into what's called the photoelectric effect, which is actually what um, uh, Albert Einstein won his Nobel Prize for, was describing the photoelectric effect. Why, when you shine light on different elements, they, pr they pr pr produce. present, produce a different spectrum of light. Yeah. But anyways, so this light hits the electron, and you know what happens? What happens? It excites the electron. The electron gets excited and it jumps up to a higher energy level. Oh, right? The electron absorbs that light. The light has energy. Now that electron has more energy, it jumps up to a higher energy level. Is that even legal? Like, why? No, like, seriously. Is this allowed? Yeah, why is he doing that? What is he going to do? Well, it doesn't really. So, what is energy? So, if we're talking about kinetic, kinetic energy. It's, it, it, it is somewhat a, a measurement of velocity, right? It's exactly kinetic energy is one half the mass of an object times its velocity squared, but it's somewhat equivalent <laughs> with its velocity, okay? And so if this, if this is getting hit by light, it's going to speed it up. And if the electron is sped up, it's going to get further away from the nucleus. Okay, wait, so is it losing energy when it goes to that next slide? No, it's gaining energy. Oh. Yeah, to get further away from the nucleus requires more energy. Because this is negatively charged, the nucleus is, what, positively charged. You know that opposites attract, and so the, the nucleus is actually holding on to those electrons. If that electron gets some more velocity, it can get further away from that nucleus. But if the electron was here to begin with, where do you think the electron wants to be? Carrie. Sorry, Carrie, ask your question. You don't have to answer mine. Um, so the second, like, shell would be empty, right? Yeah. Yes, at this point, yeah. So for lithium, when this electron jumps up to that energy level, now this second energy level is empty. And if you had four electrons in the valence shell, would all four of them move up? Or like uh, if they all got hit by light, okay. yes, absolutely. You could get all... Anytime a photon of light, an individual piece of light, light is weird, it's... it's it functions as a wave, but it also travels in, in particles and behaves like a particle. Anyways, every time an electron gets hit by light, it's going to be excited, and it's going to jump to a higher energy level. So you have, like, three in the outer one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, shh. If that electron wants... If that electron was there to begin with, where do you think that electron wants to be? Um... Do you think it wants to be there? Or do you think it wants to be here? It wants to be closer to the It wants to be here, and it doesn't really matter what it wants, but this is where it's most stable. So this electron, there's basically three options for this electron, okay? Here are the three options. Either it drops back down, that's one option, okay? One option is for that electron to drop back down. When it does, what happens? It loses energy. And it ha loses energy as what? Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Why is it going to close to the nucleus and loses energy? Um, well, it's, it's going to closer to the nucleus because it's losing oh, okay. energy. Yes. Yeah. So, step, there's, there's actually, there's, there's, two, there's three options. Two of them require dropping back down. Okay? So, if this drops back down in energy, it's going to release light. Okay, so when that electron drops back down, it's going to release light. Typically, the same frequency of light that it absorbed. How did Einstein know this? Uh, because he just worked with a whole bunch of different elements, shined light on them, and then interpreted the different spectrum of light. Carrie. Um, when you're looking at a molecule or an atom, can you tell um, that it's been hit by light, or would you be curious yes. the number of different shells and think it's a different element? Every element will emit a very specific spectrum when it is excited by a specific type of light. So you could actually tell what element it is, even if you didn't know what element it is, but you shined a very specific frequency of light at it, 
and then you saw what spectrum of, of light it actually emitted, you could tell what element it was. You shouldn't be confused as long as you know what type of light you're shining at. Mark. Just, just the tough, I talked to Einstein, this is coming to my mind. Yeah. Like, um, I remember that, I like, remember that um, at one point, Einstein, during, during, the time, like, during his, like, this new, like, golden age sort of thing, uh -huh. like that, he was proven wrong at one point. Oh, yeah, I mean, he was wrong all the time. Like, 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 I can't remember, what is this first thing, but, like, Hubble? Okay. It's like, it's like, yeah, I mean, scientists are wrong. Sure. Scientists are wrong all the time. Albert Einstein just happened to be brilliant. So he wasn't wrong as often as other people. Hang on just a moment. Okay. So, again, there are two options that involve this electron dropping back down. When it drops back down, it's going to emit light. And there's basically two options. One is that light is, that light escapes. I'm going to work so for that. If, doesn't light require energy? Light is energy. Okay, so then why would it emit light if it's losing energy? Well, in order for it to drop back down, it has to lose energy. Yeah. And so it has to release energy. And oh. then it's just a matter of what type of energy is it going to release. Is it going to release it as heat? Or is it going to release it as light? Okay. And it actually releases it, it, it as both, but mostly light. Okay? So... There's one option, light escapes. The second option is that the light gets absorbed by another electron. And it starts over. By a separate, sort of, yeah. By a separate electron. Okay, so again, I told you there are two options that involve this electron dropping down in energy. Just a, hang on, just a moment. Or did that answer your question? Okay. So one option is that it emits light that escapes, okay? And then you can actually see this because the light escapes, it can hit your eye, your brain can interpret it as a specific color. Or that light can get absorbed by a separate electron, but from a different atom, right? You see that? Because now it's left here and it's gonna get absorbed by an electron in a different atom. And then the third option is that the electron escapes. If the electron actually gets enough energy from that light, it can fully escape the nucleus of this atom. But where does it go? It goes right here. It goes right here to a product, and it goes where? Kyle, where does that electron go if it escapes this atom? The electron transport chain to where it can bounce from particle to particle to particle, every time dropping an energy level and fueling what? Kyle, what is it fueling when this electron escapes this atom, goes into the electron transport chain? What does it fuel? It fuels oxidative phosphorylation by doing what, Rick? It fuels the, the pump. Pumping hydrogen ions against their concentration cool. gradient. Emma and then Trinity. Okay. Um, so in step two, um, so can the light be absorbed by an electron in that atom? Or the yes, uh, it could, yeah, but not in this specific atom, because it would need to be by another electron in the outermost energy level. So if you had, say, an atom of oxygen, and you had six electrons in your outer energy level instead of just one, absolutely, it could be absorbed by another electron in that atom. I don't. Yeah. I know uh, Nobel made all of his money because he invented explosives. I believe he invented dynamite. If not dynamite, some other type of explosive, and he made an enormous amount of money selling his inventions to, like, the railroad industry and roads, you know, that where you got to, like, blow pieces of mountains up to be able to build a tunnel through it. And so he just made gobs and gobs and gobs of money. Gobs. And so he started He started the Nobel Prize. Uh, I believe when it started, it was just for peace, I think. Is that the, like Nobel, the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, was the original Nobel Prize, and then others were added for scientific innovation. And so now there's like a Nobel Prize for physics, 
I think there's one for chemistry. Maybe it's chemistry and physics together. There's one for physiology and medicine. There's one for economics. Is there one that's not for science? Gandhi got a Nobel Peace Prize, but so did Al Gore. So it's like the guy who invented the internet. Wow, you guys aren't, you guys really aren't old enough to know who Al Gore is? <laughs> you see your Dr. Phillips laughing. <laughs> uh, Al Gore ran for president in 2008. Yeah, so he was, so listen, I'm going to tell you who Al Gore is. He served as the vice president under Bill Clinton for his entire eight years as president. And then he ran for president after Bill Clinton did his two terms and George W. Bush ran as the Republican, Al Gore ran as the Democrat in 2008, and George W. Bush uh, beat him and, and took the presidency. And then Al Gore did not run again in 2000 and 2000. No, in 2000. 2000, you're right, 2000, sorry. Oh wow, because if it was 2008, you'd also be old enough to remember. Yeah, it was in 2000. Gosh, I'm old. That's right, because in 2008 it was Obama running against John McCain and uh, the Maverick. What's her name? Mark Cuban. No, no, no. The, no, the, the, the political matter. Gosh, what was her name? The governor of Sarah Palin. Yeah, governor of Alaska. All right. Oh, he didn't really invent the internet. Shh. It was kind of a joke because under Bill Clinton's presidency is when the internet... Um, so Bill Clinton was president from 92 to 2000. That's when the internet really gained popularity. And so they, Al Gore, as vice president... Uh, approved some measures that really helped the internet expand and become. So it's kind of a joke. It's kind of a joke. No, he did not win a Nobel Prize for helping to invent the. The, the military actually invented the internet, but that's another question. Trinity. Oh, okay. Lydia and then Isa. Well, okay, yeah, another question. So the electron support chain, like where all the like escaped electrons like go. Oh yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sort of. And then they end up ultimately inside of glucose. Yeah, it is pretty cool. So then they end up inside of glucose, and then, and then what happens to that glucose? It loses its electrons, it gets oxidized, and ultimately the electrons end up back where? After cellular respiration. Back to water, right? <laughs> That's where electrons finish. You got to think about this for a minute. Where do electrons finish after cellular respiration? They finish here in water. And this is where they begin in photosynthesis. And so it's kind of this whole big circle. Lydia and then Isa. Isa. I, it's just, it, it's, it's shared, Wi-Fi. it's shared information. If you've got a white mushroom, it's reflecting all visible light. All right. Okay, hang on. One minute. Kyle, in your experiment, what should happen if you give the plant only blue light? Yeah, it should be fine, right? If they're, if they're capable of absorbing blue light and you give the plant only blue light, it should be fine. Wait, why? Why? Yeah. Because it's it, it's capable of absorbing light in that spectrum, and if you're giving it pure blue light, I mean it may not thrive as much as if you were giving it the full spectrum, but it should be fine. It should be able to carry out photosynthesis. Okay. What about Kyle in your experiment? If you gave it only red light, something interesting. It should still be able to go through photosynthesis because we know that they absorb those frequencies of light. Do you feel like we're getting a lab out of this? I feel a little bit like we're getting a lab. What if we could figure out a way to tell whether a plant was photosynthesizing and then we filtered out all light but a specific color? It sounds like a lot of fun. To oh, that we yeah, so. except for yes, I you just... It, it is fun. It's kind of one of those fun things where you set something up and you watch it for 30 minutes. And maybe we do something else, like name that tater, or uh, name that tater. I like that. that name that bean. We got to figure out something oh, I, like I, that. I, I, the I tater is that. hard because our class is so early in the morning. No, no, the jelly beans. Emma and then Trinity. Uh, so if, I think, 
could only <laughs> absorb one of those, would it like reflect the other <laughs> If it could only absorb, like, if it could only absorb red light, yeah. it would reflect everything else. So then how would it look? Like, I have no idea. It would look probably white. Yeah, pretty white. If it was, if it was only absorbing red. Trinity. Oh, Emma asked the same thing. Okay. All right. So does this make sense? So, does it make sense why we would hypothesize from the pa from the fact that plants are green that they're absorbing light in this area and light in this area? And then you would expect that there's probably some purpose behind that. And then does it make sense how we interpreted uh, the data from Kyle's experiment? That if this is true, if you gave a plant only green light, it sh it's going to die. If you gave a plant light anywhere else in the visible spectrum, it's probably going to be okay. Mark, and then Trinity, and then Emma. Okay, so like, let, let's say that you, are, you go into like a, like a, a dark room like, yep. like with only a single like, spot. Right? Okay. So it's going like, to concentrate light on a single area. Yep. And, um, and you have a plant sitting there, like, like your, your normal everyday green plant. Okay. And you put a um a prism over the over the like over, over the spot lamp. Yes, so it, that it, it splits it into the different the colors. Colors. But yep. If, if, if it was close enough, would the green light only be kind of like it kind of basically be shining on one singular part of the plant while well, like the rest of the plant is completely black? No, it'd probably be lit up by a different color from that spectrum. But if you set it up to where only the green light was hitting that plant, that that, that plant would die. Yeah, like I'm saying, basically, like, if, like, if this is, like, completely green, like, if, like, the green light was just stuck in that one single part of the plant, would the entire plant would blow up green? Or would yes, it oh, yeah. The part that's hitting, hitting that, the green light that's only hitting that one part. Oh, he, he, I mean, it can only reflect light that's hitting it. So if there's no other light hitting it, there's nothing to reflect that. Trinity, and then Emma, and then Katie. Did you forget? Her face. Hold on, thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, I remember. So if there's, like, one... I think Emma already asked this question, just, like, a side thing. Okay, so if there's, only like, one light on the shine, I mean, it absorbed by the plant, it's white, right? It's like a white thing. If there's only... If it only absorbed one color of yeah. the visible spectrum and reflected everything else, it would probably look white. Why wouldn't it be the color that it just... Well, because if it's absorbing that color, it's not reflecting any of that light back. And so your brain couldn't get any of that light because the plant's drinking it all up. Emma and then Katie. Um, how do evergreen trees work? They just don't ever lose their needles. So how it's their, their needles are shaped such to reduce water loss. And so that's the biggest concern for a plant is losing water through its leaves. And so if it's at a time of the year where sunlight's not super direct and you don't have a lot of it, and you're not going to be carrying out a lot of photosynthesis, you're going to be losing water without the gain. So you've only got the loss and none of the gain. But the needles are shaped such that they don't really lose very much water. So it doesn't really matter that you've got, because that, that small amount of gain is okay because you're not losing very much. Well, you don't have to say, nothing gain. Yeah. <laughs> Katie and then Kyle. Okay. So do humans need a certain color light to survive? Um, that's a good question. So the main reason we need light is to convert calcium into vitamin D, and it helps with uh, red blood cell production. Um, if I don't know if there's a specific color or if you need the entire spectrum. My guess is that you really need the entire spectrum to do that efficiently. If you were like so if you were in like a room where all you had was red light, yeah. like back when you actually had to develop film and it wasn't digital pictures and you just never left the red light room. Um, as long as you took a vi uh, like a calcium supplement and a vitamin D supplement, you'd be okay. But eventually, I think you'd become anemic. 
for oh, that's, me. That's where you anemic, where you, where you, well, it, there are many ways of being anemic. It's where you don't make enough red blood cells. Oh, okay. So it could be because you have an iron deficiency, or it could be because you don't have enough vitamin D, or it could be because you've got a bleeding issue. A bleeding issue. Kyle. No, we're going to do that right now. Actually. What's the thyroid the thylakoid membrane is the innermost membrane in the chloroplast. Is this the light dependent 2.0? This is light dependent 2.0 to finish it off. To finish it off? Yep, to finish off light dependent 2.0 and to move to light independent 2.0. All right. So I would like for you to draw everything you see. And you're going to like this. Plastoquinone. Yes, it is. What does that say on this one? Plastoquinone. This one, all right. Plastocyanin. S R C Y A N I N. Plastocyanin. This is plastoquinone. This is ferrodoxin. And then this is NAD plus NAD plus reductase. And what are these little They're all complexes inside of this thylakoid membrane. Why are these little just in two before chlorosystem one? Uh, that's a wonderful question for two reasons. One, so you want the answer to your question. One is photosystem one can work in the absence of photosystem two. But so you can run all the way through this or you could just use photosystem one. And photosystem one was discovered first. That's no, they can't switch. But you can you can do this without photosystem two. As long as you have something already in place. Mark and then Lydia. Okay, Lydia. Cyanin. C-Y-A. Let me, let me clear this up a little bit. Yeah. Plastoquinone. Q-U-I-N-O-N-E. It's an enzyme. It's an enzyme that catalyzes a reduction reaction. Not a redox. A redox, yep, a redox reaction. Reduction and oxidation. Because if something's reduced, something has to be oxidized, right? If something gains electrons, something had to lose them. <laughs> All right. Chain? What's that? What is the side of chain? Cytochrome. Chrome is the R. Okay. Anybody seeing any similarities between this and when I drew the inner mitochondrial membrane with complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four? And then we drew this thing that everybody hated, and they're like, oh, that's terrible, Dr. Engel, that looks awful. And it was the electron transport chain. Yeah. Look at this. We're going to get some more terrible stuff. Uh, Boom. Wow. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Oh, Boom. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Boom. It's so oh, I'm not I can't even read the words. I don't oh. like it. What is the one I like after photosynthesis? I'm getting with Veridoxin. F E R R E D O X I N, I believe, but that might be spelled wrong. Veridoxin. Veridoxin. What are the, the, the last the cloud? Oh, yeah. What does it do after it goes to the last one? It goes to... Well, because that's a plus and that makes it either. Yeah, it goes to form N-A-D-P-H. That makes sense, yeah. 
Because huh? we knew from... So the proton, because that's why it's plus, and you bring the electron yeah, back. Well, we've got to have some protons come in as well. But we knew that from photosynthesis 1.0, <coughs> there are two, actually three products of the light-dependent reactions. <laughs> Oxygen, ATP, and what else? What was the third one? <laughs> NADPH. That acts as the final electron resting place for this portion. Okay? We already know this because we addressed this earlier today. Where do these electrons come from? Well, they're in the electron transport chain now, but where do they come from? From, the Wa from water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what you meant. That's what you meant. Okay. So they come from water, right? Water provides the electrons for this electron transport chain. Yes? Yes. We also know this because we talked about this earlier. As these electrons drop, they are dropping an energy level, and that drop in energy fuels what process? <clears throat> Kyle, from our electron transport chain in cellular respiration, when the electrons dropped, what did they fuel? Oxidative phosphorus. Yes, by fueling what? The pump, the proton pump. Okay, and so right here, check this out. Through this complex here, we're pumping, and what are we pumping? You are. The electrons are dropping, fueling the pumping of something else. Hydrogen ions, just like in the oxidative phosphorylation in cellular respiration. So we have a lot of H plus on this side, inside of the thylakoid, or inside of the, yeah, I guess, is, do we call it a thylakoid? Grana is the, is the stack. Yeah, so inside of this, anyways, we've got a lot of hydrogen ions in here because we're pumping them across. Every time an electron drops down here, it's fueling, pumping hydrogen ions into here. And what happens when we concentrate a bunch of hydrogen ions into this space? Where do they want to go? They want to go out. They want to go back out. And there's only one place they can go out, just like in cellular respiration, there was a protein that they would move through, and what is that protein? It's no longer a pro proton pump. This is a proton pump. Nope, it starts with ATP. ATP synthase. Look at that, just like what we saw in cellular respiration, true or false, plants do cellular respiration. True. True. So they are already making this for cellular respiration, and it gets a dual purpose. It also works in photosynthesis to do the same thing, and that's wow. what? What does this protein do? What does its name suggest? It synthesizes ATP. Look at that. And that's one of our products of the light-dependent reactions. Check that out, right? That's pretty cool. We know the electrons came from water. They go through this electron transport chain, ultimately go into NADPH. Okay, and then this will go over to the light independent, the light indy reactions, and the ATP will also go into the light indy reactions. Light independent reactions. Okay? And so we've got all of this taken care of. We've used water as our product. And we've accounted for all of the things that we know we make in the light dependent reactions. The only thing we haven't talked about, Kyle, is what is that something special that happens in those lower energy levels? In the ROI. We're going to talk about that right now. So photosystem 2 has a very specific frequency of light at which the electrons can break free from water. A very specific frequency of light. Very specific. Do you know what that... I, I bet you couldn't guess what color 
that light is to where it's the perfect color to get the electron to leave water. Who said red? You are so right. It is specifically, it's a frequency of 680 nanometers. Nanometers? So that's light with a frequency, or sorry, a wavelength. This is not a frequency. A wavelength of 680 nanometers. 680 nanometers. Well, so what is a meter? Uh, a measurement, yes, yeah, so it's 3.28 feet. No, it's over 3 feet. It's 3.28 feet. So a meter is a measurement of distance. What is nano? It's a prefix that means one one billionth of a unit. So a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. Okay? And so this is a very, very small wavelength. But it's light. Wait. You'd expect it to be small because we don't see the individual light waves, do we? No, no you see the light, but you don't see the individual waves. <laughs> so we have a very specific wavelength of light. Can you read this where it says 680? Yeah. 680? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. You made a mistake? No. It's 700. Why you, you said 680 like five times? So you just sat there. Well, it's because this one over here is 680. And that's both red light? They're both red. Yep, at that wavelength, it's red. Wait, where is that? That's a photosystem. Photosystem 2 is 700 nanometers. Photosystem 1 is 680 nanometers. Oh, I can't believe I did that backwards! Oh, that's so frustrating, Trinity. Okay. Uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. So, do you see what's you see what's happening? Why do plants absorb red light? Because it's already the perfect wavelength. It's already perfect, even though it's not as high energy as some of the other. Wavelengths of light, it's the perfect wavelength. That red light, it's perfect. Perfect. Perfect for what? Perfect for getting the electrons to split from water or to get the electrons to split from photosystem one and to be able to move from photosystem one over to ferrodoxin. So it's because remember, there are three options that can happen when the electron gets excited by absorbing light. What were those three options? It can escape the atom, it can send light to another electron, or it can just send that light completely away. So if you're going to get the electron to escape, it's got to be perfect. If you're going to get this electron to escape photosystem one, it's got to be perfect. So it's like, okay, well then why on earth do plants absorb blue light? Is that your question, Emma? Okay, ask your question. Okay. Okay. So, like, do clouds move because of the wind? Yes. And because of the spin of the earth. So, the entire column of air moves as the earth rotates eastward. And that's what fuels and drives wind. Uh, but the clouds move from that as well. I mean, they, they, they move along with the big column of air. Yeah. Okay. So, if, if red light is the perfect wavelength of light to get an electron to escape water and escape photosystem two and to get an electron to bounce back up in energy here in photosystem one why do plants absorb blue light because it's higher it is higher energy but remember there are three options when the electron absorbs light the electron can escape that's not going to work for blue light because it has to be perfect right it has to be red light for the electron to escape but the electron could drop back down, send its light to another electron, and a slightly different type of light than what that electron got. And they'll bounce it around. It's called, this is bonus information, but it's gonna be recorded. It's called inductive resonance. So where the electron did not absorb the perfect light, it didn't absorb red light, it absorbed blue light, but when it drops back down, it emits a different, a slightly different color of light. A neighboring electron gets that, drops back down, and emits a slightly different color of light until it gets to what type of light? Green. 
the perfect, not green, until it gets to this wavelength of light to where it's just perfect to get the electron to escape. It's red. 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 Okay? Does that make sense? So the plant doesn't want to miss out on that blue light because the electrons can bounce the energy around until it gets perfect. It's like a game of hot potato, but every time you toss the potato, something happens and it becomes a slightly different potato until it gets to a french fry, which is the absolute best type of potato, and then you don't even bother passing it. You just eat it. You, it escapes the game. But right? I thought you before Chinese? you got into a French fry, yeah. I would at least. I, I mean, like once it got baked, I dude. Just, oh. Well, you can't bake it and then fry it. Yeah. I mean, that's not going to get you a French fry. It's going to give you something different. Oh. It's going to get you like a potato cake if you baked it, because then it gets real soft and then you fry it. Good. It might be good. It's it's a Anyways, okay. Are there any questions for the from this? I know it's a lot. But it's pretty cool. Now I told you, uh, who asked wh Trinity? You asked why is why does photosystem two come before photosystem one? Oh, no. oh. To which I responded. I think we learned about this before. They found photosystem two. They found photosystem two second. So photosystem one they discovered first. But also photosystem one can keep working in the absence of photosystem two, because the electrons instead of going to NADPH. They can actually, they could, and so I want to do this in a different color because this is, this can happen, but it won't always happen. It'll only happen in the absence of water, okay? So in the absence of water, these electrons, rather than going onto NADPH, will actually bounce back to plastocyanin and then go that way again, okay? This is without water. If a plant has water to start this process and then all of a sudden the water's gone like when Emma doesn't water her plant and it starts to sag but it can still carry out photosynthesis because it'll just keep going through and doing photosystem one and generating more and more and more and more ATP without generating making NADH NADPH I mean it's still making ATP so that's not bad, it just can't go and make glucose. So it can't make glucose without making NADPH, but it can certainly keep doing this. Trinity. How long can you suck oh, well, well, well. How long can a succulent live like, without you giving it water? Oh, it depends on the type of succulent, but some of them, especially a larger individual, I mean, could go maybe years without water. I have like a smaller, never water, like it just sits there, but it's still alive. That's just like how long yeah. The biggest thing a succulent needs is it needs really good sunlight. Really good sunlight. So it doesn't really thrive in the darkness. You can overwater a plant. Oh, yeah. I mean, just like you can overwater a person. But not by dumping water on their head, but by shoving it in. You have to keep watering it like too much or it just dies. Oh, I don't know. It depends on the type of plant. Okay. So, are there any questions? Hey, are there any questions about this from photosynthesis or from photosynthesis 2.0 as the light in or the light dependent? Yeah, Kyle. Okay. So, light is it like its own thing of energy, or does the, the electron take light turn it into energy? No, light is energy. Yeah, it's 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 its own type of energy. But what the electron does when it absorbs that light is it turns it into kinetic energy. But then if that electron drops back down, it releases it as light. Light is energy. Trinity. Uh, you, 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 to, when Tori comes back. Okay. All right. Any, any questions here? Questions, questions, questions. Going once. Going twice. And we're going over to light independent. 2.0. What's that? Um, I mean, you know, you had that when you were doing... Yeah, I want to watch something. Yeah, you said... Oh. oh! We did not forget. No, he didn't promise. He never makes promises. I did not promise. Did he promise that he mentioned it? No, I didn't promise anything. We did talk about that. You know what? I have not. Let's all go outside. Okay, let's do this. Okay. So, have a seat, please. We've got to do the light independent reactions. 2.0. 2.0.
Draw a circle. Draw a circle, please. Uh, uh, we are going to write. Hang on. We're going to write one, two, three, four. We're going to write four things on the circle. You've got you've got room there for sure. And in the middle of the circle, you are going to write the Calvin. In the middle of the circle, you are going to write the Calvin cycle. And then next to Calvin, you're going to put a slash, and you're going to write the C3 cycle. Calvin, C3 cycle. I mean, we're going to write one, two, three, four, five. Five things on it. So around the circle. Oh. Okay. What are our two reactants of the overall process of photosynthesis? What are the two reactants? Glucose. Nope, glucose is a product. Oh, water the and water. light. Water, no, light. We don't typically do that for the overall reaction. We did it for ours, but that was just oh, for the light-dependent portion. Water and carbon dioxide. Oh, I thought it produces carbon dioxide. Oh. No, that's photosynthesis. Oh. Or that's uh, cellular respiration. So... We've accounted for water. We know what water does in the process of photosynthesis. What does water do? Provides the electrons. Gives us the electrons. Now we need to account for the carbon dioxide. Okay? You ready for this? So this is a circle. Where have we seen a circle before? The Krebs cycle. And remember, the Krebs cycle produces something that is involved in reaction one. Right? Exaloacetate. Do you remember that? The Krebs cycle produced exaloacetate, and that was used in reaction one. So in reaction one, in reaction one of the Krebs cycle, we take a chemical called RUBP. RUBP, which is a five carbon molecule. Wait, what is SC? SC? Five, 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 five carbons. So RUBP, which stands for ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, or you can just know it as RUBP. That will work. And so reaction one takes RUBP plus CO2 to produce, check this out, two molecules of 3PGA. So, so this is reaction one. Let me move that one because it looks ugly there. Wait, oh. So reaction one takes carbon dioxide and it attaches it to RUBP. What is RUBP again? Ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Wait, so the CO2 is going into the 2, 3, PGA? The CO2 plus RUBP are producing two molecules of 3 PGA. Step one is called fixation. Because carbon is being fixed or attached to RUBP. RUBP is a five carbon molecule. You attach one more carbon. How many carbons is that? Uh, six. Six. It immediately splits into two molecules of three PGA. So if six carbons split into two, how many carbons are in here? Three. Three carbons. Look at yes. that. Okay. So that's reaction one. Wait, how many reactions are there going to be? Two, three... Four. Oh, four, okay. four reactions. Wait, so is step one when the carbon dioxide and the RUBP get together? Or what is yes, that? step one is when carbon dioxide and RUBP get together. Okay, right. Carbon is fixed or attached to RUBP. All right, step two. We take two molecules of 3PGA and we make two molecules of B. P G. 
both of these were in glycolysis. This is this right here is the opposite of what happens in step seven of glycolysis. Well, so step seven and step 10 of glycolysis do something important. And what is that? They create ATP. So if we're doing the reverse of step seven, what's gonna happen? It's gonna require ATP. Excellent. ATP becomes ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. So this is a energy requiring step, but that's okay because what did we do during the light dependent reactions? What did we do? What did we make in the light dependent reactions? We made ATP and a lot of it. We also did make NADPH, okay? But we made ATP and we made a lot of it. So the plant has plenty of it to carry out this reaction, okay? Yeah. Yeah, inorganic phosphate. Reaction three, and I'm gonna. I, I want to come all the way to here. Wait, did you did you put what two did? How many reaction yeah, reaction two converts two molecules of three PGA to two molecules of BPG. I don't like that jump on three. Which this stands for bisphosphoglycerate, which is what. Both of these molecules are so present like, in glycolysis. There's not like a name, like, you know, for number one, you put fixation, there's nothing. Oh, there will be, but it's two and three together. Oh, okay, gotcha. Two plus three is one. called reduction. It does equal five. Way to go. <laughs> but two and three together is called reduction. And what happens in reduction? Reduce. Reduce. Oxygens Reduce. are gained. And so, or oxygens, gosh, electrons, electrons are gained. Electrons are gained. Where did the electrons end up after the light dependent reactions? What was the carrier? It wasn't NADH, like it is in glycolysis and crypt. NADPH. NADPH. To NADP plus plus the hydrogen ion. Okay, so the electrons are coming off of NADPH onto these BPGs to form something else. This is basically the reverse of the reaction six in glycolysis. And I know you can do this without looking at your notes because what do we start with? in reactions 6 through 10 of glycolysis. It's what we end with after reactions 1 through 5. Trinity. G3P. So if we're doing basically the opposite of reaction 6, when this is done, we are going to make two molecules of G3P. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And now we've got some cool things happening. That's just cool. And then all the rest of this Bro. is going to be four. I, really, I didn't enjoy how like, I don't like how like this looks. I thought we were going to have like seven steps. Four is restoration. <laughs> At some point in your life, you will get to a point where you love it. It's probably not going to happen today. Definitely will not happen on Tuesday. One day. Well, might happen on May 17th. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. Okay. So reaction four. Reaction four is actually several reactions, but nobody learns them unless you are a plant physiologist. Wait, so it ends right back at the top? Yep, it ends back. It ends with restoring RUBP so that you can start this process. Because without being able to fix carbon onto this, you can't make PGA. If you can't make PGA, you can't make BPG. If you can't make BPG, you can't make G3P. What happened to like, all the other carbons? Because there were like five four carbons and there's three, and the other one just don't exist. These are three. These are three. Okay, so here's what's fun. 
We've now, listen up. We've now accounted for all of our reactants in photosynthesis. We know what water does. It gives us the electrons. Now we know what carbon dioxide does. It's fixed onto RUBP to generate G3P. Now we've accounted for one of our products of photosynthesis. We accounted for oxygen, right? Oxygen, when you split water, oxygen is produced. So that's produced in the light-dependent reactions. But we haven't accounted for glucose, right? Which means something has to happen here with this G3P. Steps one through five of glycolysis take glucose and convert it into two molecules of G3P. Do you agree? What about if we just did the reverse of that with these two molecules of G3P? Yeah, Trinity. Isn't there when uh, it converts the glucose into 2-BTP and the loss of ATP? Yes, yeah, so if you did the reverse, you'd actually gain some ATP. Okay. Right? Is that what you were asking? Okay. All right. Shh. So the Calvin cycle does not produce sugar. What the Calvin cycle produces is G3P that can be used to make sugar. Okay? So some of this leaves, and we've got complex reactions. Complex reactions, you should write that. I will write that. To make glucose. But check this out. You're like, cool, we've got two molecules of G3P. In the first five steps of glycolysis, again, we convert glucose into two molecules of G3P. Let's just do the reverse. Is that part of the cycle? Just it's separate. It's separate from the cycle altogether. So this is separate. It's not part of the circle, right? Do you agree that that is not part of the circle? Yes. Okay, so that's separate. Those are separate reactions. Do we have a problem with taking these two molecules of G3P and making glucose with it? How do we restore this if we use all of it? Yeah, it's kind of a big problem. Actually. We've got a big problem because we can't do step four if we use it all. Okay, so we'll use one of them. So we've got a three carbon molecule. We use one of them and we take a three carbon molecule and we make a five carbon oh, molecule. Oh, shoot. No, we can't do that. We've got a problem. What's the least common multiple of three and five? One. Least common multiple of three and five is 15. So we need 15 carbons. So we're going to need how many of these? Five. We're going to need five of these to make three of these, right? Five of these to make three of these. Five of these, uh, the recording's picking this up because I'm not writing anything. We need five molecules of G3P to make three molecules of RUBP. Every time we do this cycle, we make two molecules of G3P. So how many times do we need to do this cycle to make five? If we make two every time we do it once, how many times do we have to do it to make five? Mark. Three. Three times. But when we do it three times, how many do we get? Six. Six. Five of them are needed to restore our UBP. One of them can leave. Oh. Hey, you were explaining. Yeah. Okay, it's, does, but, but do the numbers make sense? You're like, this is a three carbon molecule. We need to restore a five carbon molecule. The least common multiple of three and five is 15. So if we have five molecules of G3P, that is 15 carbons. That we can make three molecules of RUBP, which is 15 carbons. Why do you times? Well, because there's, there's, I mean, we could just do two of these, right? Hey, shh. So if we took two of these, we would have six carbons. This has five. But then we would need something to leave as one carbon, which if it's going to leave as one carbon, it would leave as what? Carbon dioxide. But that's, that's how it came in. And we know we're not making carbon dioxide during this process because carbon dioxide is a reactant. It is not a product. So, we have to do so, so we've got to do this cycle three times in order to make one G3P that can leave. Oh, yes? To, so that one G3P can leave, but that only gives us one half of a glucose, right? So we've got to do this reaction how many times to make one glucose? 
six. six times. Oh. So if we do this six times, we will trap how many molecules of carbon dioxide? Six times in all. Six times in all. So if we do this reaction, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. If we do this cycle six times, how many molecules of carbon dioxide will it require? Six. Six. How many molecules of glucose will we make? One. One. When we go through glycolysis, or we go through the entire process of cellular respiration, we take one glucose molecule, and how many carbon dioxide molecules do we make? Six. Balanced. Balanced. So if we fix six molecules of carbon dioxide, we will make one molecule of glucose, and we will restore six molecules of RUBP, which is awesome because we go through this six times. And so we need to restore six molecules of RBUBP to be used by future molecules of carbon dioxide. Okay. So I, what I want you to do in the middle of the circle, do you have room to write one more thing? No. Yes. Six times. I want you to, in the middle of the circle, write six times, and I want you to underline it twice. And so when you look at this Calvin cycle or this C3 cycle, I want you to remember you've got to do it six times to make one glucose molecule. And when you do, you restore six molecules of RUBP, which is perfect because that's how many you used. Lydia. What's that? Um, yes, the Calvin cycle. So Lydia asked, hey, guys, Lydia asked, where does this happen? You'll remember from Wednesday, the light independent portions happen in the stroma, in the fluid of the chloroplast. So this happens in the fluid of the chloroplast? This happens in the fluid of the chloroplast, not in the membrane like the light dependent reactions. And now that is almost the entire story of photosynthesis 2.0. The only thing missing is what happens when something doesn't work perfectly. But we're going to have to save that until after our exam. So we have two minutes left of class. We have two minutes for you to ask any questions on the light independent or the light dependent or any questions on anything we've learned this entire year so far because all of it is game for Tuesday's exam. Trinity. So if you did the six times, there's like two Yes. No, 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 no. If you did this, yes. If you did this six times, you will get 12. Yeah. Ten of those are going to be required to restore the five molecules, or the uh, six molecules. The other two can leave and to make glucose. Why do you need ten? The REVP, why does ten have five? Um, because, uh, so then the 10 of them, so 10 of these would be 30 carbons, 30 carbons divided by five would be six. So you'd make six molecules of RUBP. You needed one for each carbon dioxide. And if you had six carbon dioxide, you need, no, it's six, it's six and six. No, varsity basketball,